ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us um, to Chaser Takeaway video interview series where we feature a, an expert or a subject matter or relevance for British Army and Defence. Obviously, these are conversations between two academics and experts and professionals. They don't reflect the views of the Army or Ministry of Defence or any institution. And today we are discussing the evolving nature of national intelligence and how it operated in the climate of war and terror. And now it's shifting geostrategic dynamics where we talk about peer enemies and near peer enemies. Obviously, national intelligence always supported military operations and particularly since 9-11 attacks, we have seen this as an important trend emerging to such a level that it went from collecting and analyzing to targeting to even operating drones in some cases, and particularly in the example of the United States. But now that we're discussing China and Russia and mega geostrategic shifts, actually, there is a question about whether we've been prepared to think that way and whether imagining intelligence as supporting counterterrorism primarily has a curse. It enabled a lot. It clearly made our world safer. But has it actually created a weakness? Um, we have David Oakley with us to discuss all these conversations. He served as an um, intelligence officer with the Central Intelligence Agency, but also as a military officer with US Army as a strategist and as an artillery officer and currently a lecturer at the National Defense University. So a geek and an operator and somebody who has seen the interaction of these two worlds in the field for a while. Um, David, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm just going to really um, start with actually your book where you explore um, how the relationship between the CIA and Department of Defense evolved since the Cold War through War on Terror and to this day. Um, what is it that led you to have a critical perspective on the, inter the relationship between national intelligence and military operations? And what are some of the key things you found that maybe were different when you were an intelligence officer or an army officer? Hey, Zia, thank you very much for having me today. Yeah, so, you know, the, the way I came about my research, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm you know, a former CIA officer, currently, you know, still a military officer. And uh, I was at a school called the School of Advanced Military Studies at Fort Leavenworth. And one of the requirements was to do an operational level research project. And so while I was a CIA officer, I was always kind of, um, I, I always wondered about the relationship between the two organizations. And the reason why is if you've ever worked in, in, in either of the two organizations or both, I should say, they're very culturally different. And so, for example, the military is very much about, you know, processes. Um, and, you know, the CIA, uh, not so much so, you know, it's all about, it depends. It's about flexibility. It's about, you know, um, uh, adapting to the environment. And so I was, I knew they had a shared lineage. And so I, I you know, got curious about exploring that shared lineage and how they became so different. And so my initial research for SAMS was really a good news story. And so I looked at the evolution of the relationship uh, since roughly Desert Storm, and I highlighted a lot of the positives in the relationship. So for example, uh, after Desert Storm, the CIA created the Office of Military Affairs. You saw it started having national intelligence support teams, uh, uh, structures and capabilities to support the warfighter. And so it was a good news story. As I moved on into my doctoral research, I started thinking more and my, my thought about it evolved. And so while I acknowledged and appreciated the benefits, I started thinking, you know, have we gone too far? Has the United States started to, um, you know, what I call in the book, quasi-subordination of national intelligence to the warfighter? And so from there, uh, you know, I, I think for our discussion, four of the, uh, I think, important uh, points that I came to in the book are, uh, uh, Many people talk about the 1990s in the United States as kind of the lost decade, that there wasn't much done. There was a reduction in defense spending, there was a reduction in intelligence spending. What I found was uh, that decisions made in the 1990s, structural decisions, uh, relationship decisions between the CIA and DOD, set the foundation for the post 9-11 relationship. And so I argue that although the, you know, the war on terror would have forced the relationship to improve, it would have been much more painful without these decisions in the 90s. Um, so that's my first one. Um, my, my second one is um, th these, you know, these changes were part of an effort pushed by Congress and others um, to adapt after the Cold War and to focus more on intelligence support to the warfighter. And so there was a lot of congressional pressure to do this. Um, and, and a lot of it stemmed from even before 
even before Desert Storm. So if you look back into the, the early 80s uh, with the Goldwater Nichols, around the same time, there were individuals like Ike Skelton, who was a uh, congressman from Missouri, pushing for a uh, more of a role and a relationship between national intelligence and, and the military. Um, one of the important uh, aspects of, or the things I discovered um, that I think is relevant for today is I started no noticing through my research that we all define intelligence slightly different. Mm. And what I mean by that is, you know, some people I speak to, they, they will focus on intelligence, what I call in the book intelligence for action. And so, you know, I was, they're, they're looking for the, as one person told me, identifying the guy behind the door, mm -hmm. you know, so to enable action is what I call it. Um, but others will look at intelligence more from an understanding. And so an understanding to inform policymakers. And I think that's very important, especially for, for today. Um, and then finally, finally, I think that this time frame that I look at and the relationship between the CIA and DOD is not just about intelligence, but I think it's about the broader militarization in the United States of foreign policy and other policy, a dependence on that we see on the Department of Defense. Yeah, um, David, I think that point about a vision of intelligence as an enabler of the heart security and defense responses versus um, the role of intelligence as kind of scanning the horizon, making sense of the days before they happen. Obviously, it's impossible to forecast the future, but you do need people whose job is that strategic thinking, that strategic analysis, and paying attention to clues. Um, and it often felt like, if you look at the war on terror era, um, our immediate heart security response has been driven by meeting the challenge of jihadi violence, and whether it is in Afghanistan, Iraq, or globally, um, from a counterterrorism and, and counterinsurgency perspective. But even our military peers, like in US Army, in British Army, overall NATO, um, since particularly maybe 2014, maybe with the Ukraine question, um, even a bit before that, it, it, we have realized that actually, while this is a real threat, and you, you know how to deal with this to a certain extent in terms of the heart security responses, not so much so political, um, we have kind of taken our eyes off the ball with other challenges like Russia, like China, or um, adversaries that are peer enemies and near peer enemies. So if you think about intelligence, is beyond targeting, profiling individual uh, terrorist suspects or terrorists um, into um, developing networks for collection within some of the states or analysis of those states or reading the times, have we taken our eyes off the ball? And in other words, this different expectation from intelligence, has it ended up becoming um, a national liability um, that actually that pushed us to adopt into what our adversary is doing much later than actually could have done if we had stick to um, traditional role of intelligence rather than militarize it? No, I, I think so. I mean, you know, I, I remember speaking to a friend of mine that was a senior leader and it wasn't even on pure competition. He, you know, when I was asking this question during my research about, you know, what are the, what are the costs of focusing so much on counterterrorism or supporting the military? And he brought up the Arab Spring. Because I can tell you why we, we missed the Arab Spring because we were so focused on the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and counterterrorism. Um, and, and I think this, you know, this, this recognition of kind of the broader trends or the, you know, the, the flows of history, uh, you know, um, is one way to put it. I, I think when we get focused on the here and now, on more of a tactical type of uh, uh, mindset, we miss those big things. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Greg Treverton used to be the National Intelligence Council uh, uh, chair. He has a, a great um, discussion one of his books between uh, um, mysteries and puzzles. Mm -hmm. And he talks about puzzles as, you know, you get that secret information that's knowable to, to enable you to take an action. So, you know, the, a puzzle is, you know, uh, where are the missiles located? Where is the terrorist head located? We identify that, we can now take action. A mystery, on, on the other hand, is there's not this, 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 this secret information. It's more about broad understanding. And I think we've invested a lot and we've gotten very good on puzzle solving, how to find information to take action. But I think at the cost of this broad understanding, understanding the mysteries and what might lie ahead. Um, and it seems to me, I mean, at this from as an outsider perspective, 
um, it's quite a relevant question because currently, for example, we're facing the question of the pandemic, right? And some of the media reports have suggested that the intelligence reports or even diplomatic cables from China already were signaling to the fact that the scope of this virus and its spread um, wasn't necessarily as being portrayed by China or um, worded by World Health Organization. Um, but I think the current pandemic itself, for example, is, is a fascinating case study to think about an immediate development that is not necessarily a black swan. I, it was in every national security assessment. I think it was Frank Hoffman who said this is more like a pink flamenco than a black swan. This was coming, um, but it did happen. And But I think it poses a lot of questions on both the current um, intelligence operation uh, frameworks and orientations because this is a global challenge now that perhaps even those of us who spoke about this as a possibility didn't necessarily foresee to the depth of it and then also the future of intelligence orientation I mean some people are already arguing that for example the pandemic is going to force um, US government and DOD to see the home domain as a fundamental aspect of their work and maybe roll back some of the global um, presence or orientations and some of the military reforms too. How would that impact um, current intelligence and future intelligence? I mean, the pandemic and the possibility of such pandemics emerging again shortly. Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, I, going back through like the National Intelligence Council, right, and even some in, in the UK, it, people have been talking about pandemics for a while. I mean, the United States had its first, uh, uh, you know, pandemic influenza plan, I believe in like 2006. Yeah. And so I think people have seen this on the horizon. With that said, I don't, I, I, although we knew it was a possibility, I don't think we understood the repercussions. And there wasn't a lot of um, discussion between those who understood as a possibility and those who had a role in preparing for that possibility. Mm. Uh, and, and so, I, you know, and I, to me, I think what a lot of that boils down to, at least in the United States, we've had this very kind of narrow definition of security. I and mean, this is something scholars have talked about for a long time. You know, what is security? And I think in the United States, we, we look at security from, you know, although we've had homeland security and stuff like that, but even homeland security was developed because of terrorism. Um, most of it has been focused on protecting from an adversary, whether it's a state or non-state actor. I think what, to me, what the pandemic raises in my mind is what is really more of a threat to the livelihood, the well-being of a nation. Terrorism or a pandemic, which you look at the, the current one, uh, you know, in the United States, over a million infected, over 60,000 dead. Um, you know, you look at businesses, you, 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 look, at, you look at all the effects of this. Um, I, I would argue that the pandemic is much more of a security threat to, 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 to the United States and its, its future. Now, I want to be cautious because Usually in the United States, when you say security, we normally say, okay, the solution is the Department of Defense. And this ties back to my book a little bit. Um, just because it's a security issue does not mean the Department of Defense is the solution. I think, you know, just as we've militarized our foreign policy, we, we, we run the risk of militarizing our response to pandemics and stuff. So instead of, I, I get really uh, a little nervous whenever I see former generals uh, like General Andre on CNN uh, interviewing them, because I think in the American's mind, the solution is, hey, let's ex establish a joint task force and let's send the military out and, and deploy this. And I don't think that's the right answer. Military has a role. There's a lot of capabilities the military can support, but there's individuals who understand and are better postured to understand what the solution is in, in something like this. And so, you know, my argument is instead of, you know, saying, okay, let, let us militarize this solution, why don't we expand our concept of security and invest more in HHS, invest more in, you know, Department of State? Um, because there is, you know, the other thing this pandemic has brought up is this just isn't, as much as we'd like to close down the borders, you know, as policy, this is an international phenomenon. And it's, it's we have to have a, international response to it and we have to ensure that those partnerships are in place the planning is in place um yeah yeah and david i think even in this pandemic episode right so there is still that question of 
okay, you have the deep tells, the collectors, the input coming from all sorts of directions. Um, but in the end of the day, how they're analyzed, put together, communicated to policymakers, and what they do with that information kind of um, is the main challenge. I mean, a few people have written articles arguing that um, the responses to pandemic reflects an intelligence failure, but if intelligence is already there, is this really an intelligence failure or is this actually a policy failure? But it seems to me, currently, given the fact that we have so much open source information, right, we're not really suffering from lack of information. Um, on top of that, you have the signals intelligence or all sorts of communication capabilities within the 5.5 communities, right? US is advanced and the UK and our partners in Europe and, and Australia and New Zealand, etc. cetera. Um, on top of that, the human intelligence aspect of it, which again, we've given this group of countries in 5.5's superb network or people are happy to or, or willing to share information. But when you think about the overflow of all of this, all the information that comes into the DC, to London, to Paris, and et cetera, um, is technological developments like artificial intelligence going to play a better role than us sifting through some of this intelligence um, gathering? Or is it going to be more, again, back to individuals who are able to draw from all of these, but somehow we're helping them as analysts to think beyond kind of those black swan paradigm, pay attention to pink flamingos and actually see, put the dots together, or is it going to be new structures, right? Um, I realize my shadow is expanding because somehow London has started <laughs> to give up on the sunshine in the middle of this conversation. Um, or is the answer um, a new structure, right? Um, do we need to create new entities, new bodies, or do we demolish 10, 15, 20 intelligence agencies or intelligence routes um, countries in FIFI's community have? Or are we just better off living it as where things are? It's just that we focus on individuals in this process. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll begin because I think you raised um, a, a, an important question. In my mind, the difference between collection and analysis. And so I've been reading a lot of, it, well, I'll begin with, uh, you know, the intelligence failure. I, I don't see it, if from what I'm reading, this has been a warning. Um, I don't really see it as an intelligence failure. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it seems like people were aware. Now, I think... You know, to the degree that they were aware and the degree they were warning, it will take some time before we know that. Uh, but, but back to the analysis and collection. You know, to me, um, I, I think I was never an analyst, but it seems to me, and this is back to, to Trevor Tim's Puzzles and Mysteries, if we really want to generate intelligence for understanding, if we really want to know the mysteries, we have to strengthen the relationship between the analyst and the policymaker. We have to, you know, the analyst has to help the policymaker understand not an issue, but how that issue rests and nests with the broader world and other issues. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so we've done a lot of, with, we've done within the US, we've done a lot of increasing the relationship between the collectors and the analyst. And you look at the CIA and their, um, the way they've restructured has focused on that. Although that's helpful, I think, for taking action, I don't know if it's as helpful for informing policymakers, creating this understanding for policymakers. And so that's one thing. Um, when I look at, you know, I've, I've been reading some articles on the role of human intelligence. I'm very cautious because whenever I think of, and this goes back to my, to my, um, uh, to the mention of the difference in how people perceive intelligence. Um, from, from my experience, at the CIA was in the director of operations. And I was always taught that, you know, intelligence, um, you know, to, to deem something intelligence, it had to be clandestinely acquired. And so what that means is you don't send out, you know, finite resources, human resources to collect information that you can get in the open, right? You don't want, you don't want case officers out taking polls <laughs> or you know, going out and asking, risking their lives to, to you know, get, or risking their assets lives to collect information that's open source. You mean okay. Jack Ryan is not a real character? Is that <laughs> your <point? laughs> So um, yeah, the, 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 the ultimate operator geek. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, but, and, and so for the, for the collectors, you know, we, we, we don't want to change, you know, intelligence needs to be very narrow for the human, right? It's, it's information that cannot be sought in the open. You need that clandestine capability. Now, for the analyst, though, the analyst needs information that's not only secrets, but that's open source, that's in the media, that's collected from different places. So their definition of intelligence will be, in my view, different, because their, their purpose they're serving is different. And that definition of, uh, of intelligence is guiding that, guiding that purpose. Um, 
Re regarding structure, what I, what I fear, and I think an example would be our response to, to, to terrorism in the United States. Um, we created a lot of structure and they've done some great work. Um, you know, stuff like the National Counterterrorism Center stuff has done some great work. But it does become problematic that when we adjust our, our structures um, to respond to the latest issue or the latest flavor, and we get, we get hyper-focused on that. Um, you know, I think a good, what, what I would encourage is, you know, maybe we need to think more of a breadth of expertise collectively working together to generate this understanding among, among like analysts, instead of creating individual stovepipes. Um, so I'll use it for example, right now, one of the issues um, in, in the house is they, they, there's, a, there's a bill out to create a um, climate um, uh, center in the intelligence community. And I always think to myself, you know, I, I think it's positive that the, the, the analysts, again, we don't want human collectors going out collecting, you know, uh, climate samples or, you know, climate data. Uh, but I think it's great that the analysts are considering it. But I don't think it should be stovepipe. I mean, I think this expertise, this knowledge should be spread out because the way it affects one region will, will you know, um, if it leads to war, if it leads to, you know, uh, movement, migration of people, in one region, it's going to be quite different than in the other. So you need this broad knowledge and understanding across the different areas. And that is much different than how it might affect the homeland. Uh, but I think you, you don't create a center then. You then spread out this talent in the organizations that have that understanding. Um, as for the, 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 the technology question, um, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I haven't really researched AI and technology, uh, but I, you know, uh, but I do read about it. And it seems to me when you have the data out there doubling every two years that the, you, you need to have some AI support to the analyst to go through the information because there's so much information overload, yeah. right? And so you need that technological help, but you still have to depend on the analyst. And so while I think it's good to, you know, to have, um, like in the United States, we have something called AIM, uh, which is an initiative within the intelligence community to, to enable the analyst you still have to depend on the analyst. I mean, you still have to train analysts who are broad thinking and understand not just their issue, but how their issue is in relationship to other issues. Um, and part of that, you know, it's, it's interesting. I always talk to my, uh, uh, you know, m most of my students are practitioners. Well, I should say all of my students are practitioners. And one of the things I, you know, we always speak about is we, we discuss understanding the environment. Mm -hmm. We became very good about appreciating or better, I shouldn't say very good, but we became better about appreciating the environment when it comes to the other. And so, you know, we, we talk about socioeconomic and the other. We aren't very good yet at analyzing ourselves. Yeah. And, and understanding how we ourselves or institutions or organizations, our interests affect the way we see the problem and the possibilities in responding to the problem. Yeah. Um, definitely. I think half of interpretation is the object you're studying. The remaining half is actually you, what questions you're asking, what methods you're deploying, what insights you're inferring to. It's a lot about you as much as it's a lot of the object. Thank you so much, David. This has been a very rich conversation. Um, your book is full of extremely fascinating nuggets of insights because it draws from a lot of interviews with people with hands-on experience of both military operations and intelligence operations since Cold War and in War and Terror. I think you raised very important questions about this different expectation from intelligence as enabling operations and tactical needs versus providing the strategic questions and challenge and sometimes challenging the assumptions and the direction of the politics and political responses. I think our conversations in Europe that are highly relevant for us. And thank you so much for your time. And thanks to everybody who watched us. And if you want to watch more videos like that, do check out um, www.chaser.org.uk on our website. Thank you so much, David. Hey, thanks, Z. I really appreciate it.